So, let us uh, continue to talk about the science based uh, foundation of steel making and I have already briefly uh, told you about uh, the relevance of thermodynamics and try to introduce certain key concepts of thermodynamics and as I have mentioned that it is not possible to cover each and every topic, but at least in the context of prediction uh, of feasibility of a reaction or uh, equilibrium calculation, I have tried to make use of certain concepts and demonstrate to you that yes, uh, with the uh, knowledge of equilibrium, uh, knowledge of uh, activity composition relationship etcetera, you will be able to you know, formulate equations, uh, use thermodynamic data and then make prediction about the state of equilibrium in terms of temperature, pressure and composition. Now, on thermodynamics there are various textbooks available. For example, a nice UG textbook that we follow at IIT Kanpur is the textbook by Professor Gaskell. There are innumerable other metallurgical thermodynamics textbooks and I urge that you go through that text uh, in order to get a comprehensive uh, idea of the subject of thermodynamics. Uh, following thermodynamics, now uh, I would like to talk about uh, fluid dynamics. Now, steel making per se from the stage of basic oxygen furnace uh, to down to continuous casting. At every stage, we have processing and transfer operations and these are controlled by uh, fluid flow in the sense that melt flow or flow of steel in reactors like BOF, EAF, ladles, Candish and mold will control the interfacial reaction rates, will control the mass transport within the fluid, will control refractory metal interactions and uh, refractory erosion rates. You name a process which is occurring in the steel making reactor and you will find that at the root of that problem, the fluid flow really plays a decisive role. Now, we, we all know that for example, uh, uh, if you introduce stirring, uh, the mass transport and mixing is going to be very, very uh, intense. For example, if you take a cup of uh, tea, uh, add a spoon of sugar and you do not stir it, then the sugar does not dissolve. Okay? So, to get a homogeneous mixture of uh, sugar in, tea, in your tea, you have to stir it vigorously with a spoon and then only you get a mixture and that is why in every stage of steel making as we see that we try to deliberately introduce stirring either by injecting an inert gas or a reacting gas or the metal falling from a certain height and this creates enormous amount of convection current in the system and um, that convection current aids in controlling the rate of heat and mass transport and various other uh, processes. For example, it may, you name it and the process is going to be have most of 99 percent of the cases you will see that you know at the, the rate of the process is really enhanced uh, by and the fluid dynamics prevalent in the reactor. Now, intensity of flow is very important for us and the intensity of flow uh, can be regulated uh, or, or depends on the system geometry. Uh, it depends on uh, the power which is stirring power we say which is being fed into the reactor and the level of intensity will eventually determine. For example, if you have, if you have added an alloying addition and you want the alloying addition to melt and dissolve in the bath, you invariably will conclude that greater is the stirring rate in the system, greater is the movement of the fluid, more will be the rate or faster will be the rate of melting and dissolution. So, there is no ambiguity as far as the relevance of fluid dynamics in steel making. Uh, it is a very complex subject, you require very good knowledge of maths, you require very good knowledge of vector and tensor in order to understand the subject and it is the scope of the subject is enormous. You can run you know, there can be diverse topics which are involved, uh, uh, starting from uh, you know simple laws of fluid dynamics to complex flows, turbulence, and etcetera. And and the scope is enormous, and possibly it will be very difficult for me to you know introduce all the concepts. But I am going to uh, try to highlight the role of fluid flow and how can you know? Our objective is you know to know the state of fluid motion in the reactor. Having obtained the information about fluid flow, how can you use that information to predict the rate of metallurgical processes or steel making processes is our essential objective. And I will hover around that central point that how to get some meaningful information about the state of fluid motion in steel making reactor and to be able to do that, what is uh, what information uh, do you require at our end. Now, the intensity of flow in steel making reactor varies appreciably from one process to another process. So, we understand that the nature of fluid motion in steel making reactor are going to be different. By nature, I am saying 
that is the intensity of fluid motion is very small, maybe we can get a laminar or a transition flow. Uh, on the other hand, if the intensity of motion is vigorous, uh, in that case we can have uh, turbulent motion in the system. Now, I have mentioned to you uh, that for example, in tan dishes, we have a flow of the order of centimeters per second. When you have a finest tapping operation, we may have flows of the order of few meters per second. So, therefore, the state of fluid motions in reactors are uh, different and invariably, we will see that because the size of the reactor is large. Uh, and that the kinematic viscosity of steel is very, very small. So, therefore, the Reynolds number of the flows are appreciable under steel making conditions. So, as a thumb rule, we can say that flows in steel making reactors are going to be invariably turbulent. What are the other characteristics of the flow? Other characteristics of the flow would be, is the flow one dimensional, two dimensional or three dimensional? Because now, for example, in a pipe flow problem, the fluid goes, moves, comes at a one end leaves at one other end, this we say as a, there is a predominant direction of motion, but in steel making reactors, these are all three dimensional reactors. So, there is x component of fluid flow also, there is y component of fluid flow, there is z component of fluid flow. Okay. So, all three components of motion are going to be prevalent. So, simplification and idealization in terms of dimensionality of the problem is not going to be very much advantageous uh, uh, in our case, and we will find that the flows in majority of the cases are going to be three dimensional in nature, pipe flow type problems or flow over a flat plate type problems, these classical flow problems will never be encountered under steel making uh, situation. Particularly, if you look at the processes starting from BOF to the uh, continuous casting, nowhere um, approximation of uh, you know a two dimensional flow or a one dimensional flow will be tenable. Now, is the flow steady or the unsteady? The next question that we ask that uh, now, depending on the process, the flow can either be steady or unsteady, because we know that if flow becomes in the, when the process is just started. For example, the ladle is sitting, metal is sitting in the ladle and the moment I start to inject gas, from that moment onwards, the velocity is going to change as a function of time. At some point of time, the velocity will become constant. So, that looks something like this. So, for example, if you plot velocity at a location versus time with gas injection in a ladle, okay, small little figure I draw. So, I introduce a gas here and then the flow develops and you see the flow goes something like this. So, this is basically the period which is called the flow establishment period or the period of transients. That means, we have started to blow gas and then for some time what happens is we have a power which is the buoyancy power which we input through the gas and it accelerates the fluid and at some point what happened is the energy supplied by the bubble is balanced by the losses uh, you know through various mechanisms and then we obtain a steady state process. Just like the way you take a, a kettle of water and you try to heat it. So, initially the temperature of the melt uh, temperature of water is going to be increased and at some point of time the rate of heat input to the kettle will be exactly balanced by the rate of heat loss and then you are going to hit a constant temperature that is the characteristics also exhibited in this particular case from 0 the velocity is 0. So, the velocity starts to increase as we introduce gas and then eventually the velocity becomes a steady state. So, it depends on the process in which we are looking at. If you are looking at the initial period of gas injection the flow is unsteady. If you are looking at a long duration of gas injection. In that case, we can say that the flow is steady. Furnace tapping operation, continuously the bath is being filled up. The ladle is empty initially, metal is coming from the furnace, it is being poured into the ladle and as a result of which the bath depth increases. And as the bath depth increases, the distance between the lip of the mouth as well as the free surface or the surface of the liquid continuously decreases as this level increases. So, the distance between distance of separation between the furnace lip and the level of melt continuously decreases. So, as a result of which the flow phenomena in the system throughout the tapping operation remains unsteady. So, we will not be able to just say always that the flow is steady or unsteady depending on the scenario the flow can be steady or flow can be unsteady. Okay. Now, having said so, so we understand that our flows are going to be multidimensional, mostly three dimensional flows are going to be unsteady flows are or steady depending on the process, depending on the duration at which we are concentrating, flows are most likely going to be turbulent. Now, we have 
non isothermality also in steel making reactors because i have been saying all along that uh, we we know um, that uh, we have a furnace or a ladle and then through the wall or through the mouth the uh, you know heat radiates so as a result of which we can expect that if we have a, a vof converter here you know uh, particularly when there is not much stirring okay so i can say it is going like this so there is expected to be some gradient in temperature and this difference in temperature will depend on how good a stirring is there this difference in temperature will be minimum if the stirring in the bath is very very good if this difference in temperature could be pronounced if the stirring in the bulk of the metal is not same so there is difference in temperature there could be difference in temperature in the system ladle which is being held at some you know there is no gas injection nothing like that so the ladle contains molten metal and then that there is going to be heat loss through all the surfaces and as a result of heat loss there is going to be difference in temperature between various locations so this will have a higher temperature this will have a lower temperature because of heat loss and as a result of which we have differential temperature which makes the process non isothermal in nature so we are not talking of isothermal process so the fluid flow melt flow is going to take it under non isothermal condition and non isothermality as you must be knowing from your basic transport phenomena may introduce some kind of a thermal buoyancy into the system and what governs thermal buoyancy with vis a vis the force convection free to force convection is the ratio which we say it is crash of sulfur the reynolds number square it is this term that will say for example whether we have a strong free convection current or strong force force convection current crash of number is a measure of the buoyancy reynolds number is a measure of inertial forces so calculating this ratio we should be able to find out that uh, whether free convection is important or not so therefore i may have force convection when i am introducing a gas into the system or i may have some alternative form of stirring electromagnetic stirring okay and also i may have free convection also and free convection particularly because of thermal gradients or because of concentration gradients we may have free convection currents in the system so whether free convection is important so there may be some situations in which there will be no force convection for example holding period in a ladle where there is no gas is being injected into the ladle okay in that case i will have no force convection but if there is any flow at all that flow is going to be attributed to free convection on the other hand when i am going to have a gas injection into the ladle i will have both force convection and free convection because free convection will be there because of temperature differential in the system thermal stratification in the system and force convection flow uh, which is going to be there because of uh, the introduction of the gas itself now whether free convection effects are important or not as i have mentioned this will be dictated by this particular number now the coming back to the issue of non isothermality so therefore in some systems where we have no strong force convection current in that case the non isothermality can effect our fluid flow because we know that difference in temperature will cause difference in density so heavier density fluid will go down lighter density fluid will go up and that creates a natural convection current under the influence of gravity and that is called natural convection or thermal buoyancy and so, so therefore any isothermality may also affect the fluid flow condition in the system that can precipitate into fluid flow in the system naturally because of thermal gradient similarly if you have concentration gradient okay that concentration gradient for example at some point you have little amount of carbon at somewhere you have bigger amount of carbon so more carbon means less density less carbon means higher density in steel so therefore you are going to have a differential motion and as a result of which you have a buoyancy which is not thermal buoyancy but which is we call as a solutile buoyancy so in steel making systems where we have concentration gradients in the system where we have temperature gradients in the system we will see that the fluid flow in the system or melt flow in the system could be a result of the combined effect of thermosolutile convection also in addition to forced convection for example particularly if you look at the continuous casting suppose you are considering a bloom casting and you know that there is a metallurgical length and this bloom casting we have a you go towards the lower part of the metallurgical length where we have little bit core of liquid and rest everything is solidified and there virtually you don't see 
the impact of the SEN because the SEN is located much high metallurgical length we are talking about 10 meters or 8 meters. So, therefore, I am talking of a distance of 7 meters down the meniscus where we may note some weak motion and that weak motion it is now well known is as a result of thermosolutal convection. Okay. So, within the mold region in continuous casting the flow is going to be primarily driven by force convection because of the impingement of the uh, incoming jet of molten steel. On the other hand towards the lower part of the strand where we have still some molten metal and there if you see any noticeable motion and that noticeable motion is going to be as a result of thermo solutal buoyancy. That means, there is a difference in temperature, there is a difference in concentration and both this difference in concentration and difference in pressure, difference in temperature have precipitated into flow. So, non isothermality can be a big factor in our fluid flow in our melt flow analysis. Concentration difference also can play an important role in our fluid flow understanding. Most importantly, however, is that in a steel making reactor, be it little, be it primary steel making converter BOF or EOF, you have multiphase interaction. It is not just flow of one fluid. We have gas is flowing, okay. we have liquid is flowing, we have slag is flowing, we have added solid, the solid may be moving in the system. Okay. So, it is a multiphase system. So, therefore, to summarize the nature of steel making flows, I would say that steel making flows are multidimensional steel making flows could be transient or steady they are invariably turbulent Free convection or I will say thermosolutal convection. Thermosolutal convection is important. Thermosolutal solutal convection. So, multidimensional, transient or steady, turbulent, thermosolutal convection plus multiphase flows. You name a complexity, you will find it in steel making. And also, for example, in some cases, what we see that on top of this flow, the domain either shrinks or expands because of solidification and melting phenomena, which is the consequence of heat transfer itself. So, the fluid flow or the flow of melt is not as per se is a unique phenomena. Okay? It is actually interrelated to so many other things which are going to influence the flow. Okay? It is not just like a simple flow of a pipe flow or a homogeneous fluid moving in a tank. No, it is not that kind of a flow. You name a phenomena, solidification, multiphase, thermosolutal convection, all these features characteristics are going to influence the flow. So, therefore, we have to understand all these things in great detail in order to address the fluid flow or fluid dynamics in steel making reactors. So, the subject at hand is an extremely complex uh, you know and it is going to be the scope is going to be enormous as you see so many types of concepts are uh, they are particularly the subjects of turbulence the subjects of multiphase flows the subjects of thermosolutal convection these are in a free convection these themselves are uh, you know um, a huge uh, topic uh, with enormous scope and uh, you know on each of these subject maybe more one maybe more than one uh, semester course can be run uh, and you can imagine therefore, that the effort and time that will be needed uh, in order to master the subject of fluid dynamics and then apply the theory and our understanding to the reactor in order to see how does uh, the fluid flow really influences the process. And as I said in the beginning that our objective is we have to know about the state of fluid motion somehow in the system. So, this is you know cutthroat statement. Okay? The theory stays in its place you know the textbooks are in, in their place, but as a steel making engineer, steel maker, my objective is to know the flow and why I know wish to know the flow, because I want to calculate melting rates, I want to calculate desulphurization rates, I want to calculate refractory erosion, all these things are my basic aim, okay. but at the background I see that these are intricately related to fluid dynamics in the reactor. So, therefore, I have no option, but to study the subject of fluid dynamics in great detail so that I can really address 
the rate of the metallurgical processes that are being taking place uh, in uh, the steel making reactors. Now, how can you predict or know the state of fluid motion? I am not going to discuss the theory is enormous. So, it is not possible for me to discuss the, the theory. So, I am addressing it that you know uh, from, uh, from the really from the end point objective that how do you know the fluid flow, how can you calculate the fluid flow, uh, why, what are the resources that we need. We have of course, many text, textbooks which we can follow understand the fundamentals and assuming that we have the fundamentals uh, you know uh, proper fundamentals. The questions that I pose before you is how do we know the state of fluid motion this is the basic or the essential problem Concepts like parallel flow, Newton laws of viscosity, Navier Stokes equation, irrotational flows, then uh, simple parabolic flows, uh, creeping flows, these are very essential in order to develop a comprehensive framework of for our understanding. But assuming that we know you know our fundamentals are ready, uh, we are ready in terms of our fundamentals, the question is now how do you know the state of fluid motion in steel making reactors. Now, in any system, we can get information about a given phenomena either by carrying out experiments or by carrying out uh, calculations. Okay. We can develop a simple mathematical model for example, and then we can find out that what is the state of fluid motion or we can use a probe or a sensor and then find out that what is the state of fluid motion. So, we have two different standpoints. Now, one is experimentally we can obtain the fluid flow info information about the flow. And number two is theoretically, provided an adequate theoretical background exists. Okay. In many of the cases, because of the complexity of the flow, we are going to see that an adequate mathematical description, adequate means near perfect mathematical description still does not exist. Okay. And therefore, as I have mentioned uh, uh, or as you might, might be knowing that uh, if, if, if the mathematical description, if the theoretical background is not right, if the mathematical model is not correct, in that case we will not be able to predict the process uh, correctly. Now, coming back to this point, experimentally it is perhaps extremely cumbersome, it would be extremely cumbersome to determine or map the velocity field in a BOF reactor. Uh, we may not have probes, because we require probes which you have to immerse, uh, steel is opaque, so we cannot see what is going on and that we may not have probes which can work uh, on a sustained basis under such a rugged environment of 1600 degrees centigrade and in a huge reactor size. So, perhaps we can say that experimental determination, rigorous experimental determination or mapping of flow field in steel making reactor as of now is not possible. It is going to be enormously time consuming, it is going to be very difficult, it is going to be very expensive. So, we can rule out the possibility. So, only as possibility is that we can calculate possibly uh, the melt flow phenomena uh, you know uh, from a theoretical background steel as we all know uh, is a newtonian fluid so the theory of newtonian fluids can be applied uh, uh, and although molten steel would exhibit uh, most of the time uh, incompressible flows but if you are injecting gases okay to the bottom in that case the gas density can change enormously because of the difference in temperature and some compressibility effect can come as far as the motion of the gas is concerned while the flow of liquid is concerned uh, the compressibility may not have direct relevance of course the motion of gas would influence the motion of the liquid there so if the gas compressibility influences the motion of the steel motion of the gas okay in that case there is going to be an indirect influence of gas compressibility on the movement of liquid steel now, how does when you inject gas, how does the liquid moves? The liquid moves because of the application of drag forces. The bubbles move or the gas stream moves, it drags along with it fluid and therefore, there is going to be momentum exchanges uh, between the gas and the liquid. There are going to be various uh, surface and surface forces through which uh, the gas and the liquid are going to interact 
and they interchange momentum through their surfaces and as a result of which the bubbles or the gas as it rises, okay, it imparts momentum to the liquid and the liquid recirculates. That concept uh, perhaps you know from your elementary transport phenomena. So, we have to seek for a theoretical background. Now, we can first say that, well, look, when you are talking of a theoretical background and we want to know the velocity and this velocity comes from basically expression comes from the Newton's law of motion. So, the theoretical background is formulated on the basis of Newton's law of motion and where we say that uh, the net acceleration produced is equal to the algebraic sum of the forces and what are the forces that are acting in the fluid one may take into account. And when we consider that pressure, inertial, gravitational and viscous forces are the only relevant forces which are acting in the fluid element and then if we carry out a control volume based uh, uh, analysis or derivation, then we can derive what is known as the conservation of momentum. We can carry out a conservation of momentum, conservation of momentum or which is essentially and this gives rise to what is known as the Navier stroke. So, the basic framework based on which the velocity fields within steel melt is going to be calculated is the Navier Stokes equation. And we all know that in the Navier Stokes equation, we have other expressions like Stokes law etcetera, which are incorporated. So, this also statement is not unfamiliar to you, you, have, you, you know this statement, you know a statement of Navier Stokes or the Navier Stokes equation from your knowledge of transport phenomena. So, we have an overall continuity equation and the three equation of balances. So, because we are talking of multidimensional flow, that means we are going to have three different components of flow. If you have x, y, and z, okay, y, z, x. So, we have a v x component of flow, we have a v y component of flow, we have a v z component of flow. Okay. So, there is a v x conservation of momentum, there is a v y conservation of momentum, there is a v z conservation of momentum or we can say there is an x component of motion equation for x component of motion, which is essentially the Newton's law force balance equation applied along the x direction. Then we can say there is a z equation of motion along the z direction, which is a momentum conservation equation along the z direction. And then we can say similarly that there is a conservation of momentum or equation of motion along the y direction. So, we have three different equations therefore when you talk of a multidimensional or a three dimensional scenario. Okay. And these three equations as we will see, for example, I can write down, if I write down the unsteady state equation for example, one such equation I can show that I write it in a conservative form, three dimensional So, this is the x component of motion that I am, I am writing actually and so these are the viscous terms now that I am writing. This is the pressure force or pressure gradient term and this is the viscous term along the x direction. This is the viscous term along the y direction and this is the viscous term along the z direction. And note that I have considered that well the system under consideration can be described by. So, we have selected, we assume that the system under consideration can be dictated, written or uh, expressed in terms of a Cartesian coordinate system. So, we can have the Navier Stokes equation in cylindrical polar coordinate system, we have in spherical coordinate system and then we have rho g x. Okay. And obviously, if you are saying that it is a gravitational component, 
the component of gx along the x g along the x direction is gx and that is in this particular case if gravity is the force is actually is equal to 0 now so if we have x ux component x component of mo equation then we similarly will have a term y component and similarly we have third equation as and note that these equations i have written in terms of in the unsteady state mode, because I have a net rate of accumulation term, this derivative term becomes equal to 0. So, conservation of momentum, if it is a three dimensional flow, we get three such equations. Okay. And on, because in these three such equations, we have unknowns are what? Unknowns are u x, u z, u y, there are three unknowns, but on top of that, we see that there is another unknown pressure, which is to be calculated as a part of the solution. So, the fourth equation, which is needed always is the overall continuity equation. And if I say that the flow is incompressible, then I can write that well, this equation goes like note that I have written this equation for an incompressible flow, I have written this equation for a Newtonian fluid because of the viscous strain, stress is ta taken to be directly proportional to uh, the strain rate. And now, I have 1, 2, 3, 4 equations and I have 1, 2, 3 and 4 unknowns. So, these are my 4 unknowns, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3. Okay. These are the 4 unknowns and I have 4 equations. So, therefore, if I can solve these equations with the correct number, of course, these are partial differential equations, I will require boundary conditions or initial conditions to be expressed, okay, appropriate number, assuming that we have uh, the correct number of boundary conditions, we should be able to solve this equation. Note that this equation, it is valid for multidimensional flow, it is valid for transient flow, it is valid for Newtonian fluid, it is valid for incompressible flow and it is valid equally for both laminar and turbulent flow, no restrictions have been made. But if you try to solve this equation, I will come back to uh, this issue uh, a little bit later more, uh, rigor, more, more in more detail. If you try to solve this equation for turbulent flow, we are going to have some problem, but we will talk about it a little later. Right now, we see that we have four equations and four unknowns. So, that means it is a well defined problem assuming that we have the right number of boundary conditions. Now, these differential equations as you can see here are nonlinear differential equations, because you see that you have product of the velocity terms, the second order term and also these equations are interrelated. For example, this is a, this equation as I have mentioned, this is a balance or conservation of momentum along conservation of x momentum. So, that is this particular equation. Second equation is conservation of y momentum, third equation is conservation of z momentum. So, if you look at these equations, they are essentially multidimensional and you can see that they are nonlinear. And also, in this equation, it is a x momentum conservation equation, but you see the y velocity component and z velocity component appear. So, therefore, this equation and this equation are mutually coupled. Okay. Both x x velocity component depends on y and y velocity component depends on x and same is true for the z component also. So, there, so therefore, you cannot solve these equations independently, they are mutually coupled equation. All the four equations have to be solved simultaneously and you therefore, cannot solve them by hand. You have to take care of what is known as a numerical method in order to solve this uh, equation. And this is itself the numerical solution of such complex differential equation itself is a very uh, you know, uh, interesting, important subject in this particular context, which is which we call as a computational fluid dynamics or CFD. So, <coughs> it is an entire subject on its own, and uh, this is also an area uh, beyond. When you talk of, we need some expertise in fluid dynamics. We have to know fluid dynamics. We, in the context of metallurgical problems. Uh, we, we not only stop at the analytical work, you know, we have to look at 
the possibilities of numerical solutions, understand the numerical solutions well and therefore, when you say that we have to have some expertise in fluid dynamics, we will have to know the subject of CFD also or computational fluid dynamics also very well. Now, you can have four, just four equations for example, on top of this as I have mentioned that if you have thermal buoyancy, if you have solutile buoyancy in that case the flow is going to be influenced by thermosolutal convection also. So, the flow is going to be related to heat transfer and the flow of heat also from one point to another point is going to be related to fluid flow. So, therefore, if there are thermosolutile convections which are important in this particular case, we understand number one the flow will then depend on the concentration gradient, flow will depend on the temperature gradient. Also, the flow of heat or flow of mass from one point to another point is going to be related to the fluid flows also, because the flow of fluid, fluid or melt will take material from one point to another point, because it will depend on the rate at which material will flow from this point to this point or heat will flow from this point to this point will depend on the extent of or the convection current present in the system. So, in many situations where thermosolutile convections are important, we will see that the fluid dynamics equation cannot be solved in an isolated fashion, they have to be solved with heat transfer equation, mass transfer equation, which will you know, you know for constitute a, a more comprehensive and more detailed mathematical model. So, therefore, the point that I am trying to make is that we are talking of solution of not just 1, 2, 3, 4 equations in steel making systems where we have so much of complexity. In that case, invariably we will see that in many situations we are going to have more than 6, 7 or 8 equations. And solving these equations, you can you can imagine that when you have all these processes solidification and electromagnetic stirring for example, in continuous casting, okay, you have to solve the electrodynamics equation also and then additional equations will come into the picture. So, we are talking of solving of a number of nonlinear mutually interlinked partial differential equations and you know solving them. Now, you have to use computer to solve them and every time if you want to write uh, computer codes to solve these equations, write a program you know uh, debug the program, it is going to take really long time. So, we have now very important software platforms which are available to us and these softwares are basically CFD softwares, computational fluid dynamics softwares dedicated exclusively to the modeling of the kind of flow that we are talking about here. They can model multiphase flows, they can model multidimensional flow, they can model turbulent flow and you. So, you do not write a computer program, but you formulate the problem, then you go to the computational or CFD software and use the CFD software to, com, to, to, to configure your problem and thereafter you know you can uh, solve the problems very conveniently. So, when I talk of expertise in fluid dynamics, I talk of some knowledge in the theory of fluid flow. I am talking of some knowledge of CF, you know on uh, computational fluid dynamics and some knowledge on CF software, but most of the time in order to know the state of the fluid, fluid flow, uh, you will see that your theoretical background, your theoretical framework will comprise of the Navier Stokes equation. This is the essential component and on top of this, we may have different uh, segments also be coming. Uh, heat transfer, mass transfer, solidification, etcetera, which may influence fluid flow. But basically, so far as the flow is concerned, in that case, we will have to solve the Navier Stokes equation, and there we can take recourse of uh, to the computational uh, fluid dynamic softwares which are available in the market. Okay. Let us now you know discuss a little bit uh, about uh, the boundary conditions and boundary types that will give you some idea because we are we, we have generated we will generate partial differential equations to predict fluid flow uh, or melt flow in steel making systems and these equations will invariably require initial and boundary conditions and let us look at a uh, typical characteristics of you know various physical boundaries in uh, say steel making reactors so always you will see that uh, typically steel making reactors are going to be uh, exhibiting solid walls which will form the boundary of the vessels this is also solid wall we have a free surface so five of our surface in most of the cases when you are talking of uh, uh, melt flow uh, in boF little tundish 
mold, etcetera, four to five of our surfaces could be just the solid walls. For example, if you take the mold of continuous casting, you have copper cooled mold and we have four surfaces of the mold consider uh, you know are the four physical walls or solid walls and also we have a free surface. Free surface is a characteristics of uh, steel making reactors. So, you have because these are all batch reactors you sometimes pour molten metal you take out. So, you have a metal ambient interface all the time. Now, if you look at Tandish, so this is the free surface this is the, these are the solid walls. So, you have in Tandish, you have a frontal solid wall, back solid wall, two side solid wall and the bottom solid wall. So, you have five walls and the free surface and on top of that you have an flow inlet and you have a flow outlet. These are the general characteristics. of, For example, at solid walls we know that the there can be no velocity. So, the velocities are going to be 0, no slip condition. At the free surface, if it is stagnant, we know that the vertical component of the velocity is going to be 0, because it is stationary, it is neither moving this way nor moving that way. Note that we have three components of velocity. So, on each of these surfaces, on each of these surfaces, I have to write or provide boundary conditions on each of the three velocity components. This is very important, important for us to remember, but nevertheless, inlet flows are known, outlet flows are also known in this particular case, because I am considering a steady state scenario. So, therefore, height remains same. So, whatever is coming in is exactly same is going out. So, I will be knowing the velocities here, I will be knowing the velocities here, but I can there is a standard outflow procedure also that you will come to know later on as you you know take more advanced courses. So, the boundary conditions here can be prescribed in terms of the known flow rate coming from the ladle. Here also it can be conveniently prescribed. We have solid walls, the boundary conditions are standard forward, sta straight forward that is all the velocity components are 0 and at the free surface, we say that the normal to the free surface component is 0 and transverse com gradient of the transverse components. These are the two transverse components on the free surface and their gradient is actually 0 at the free surface. Alternatively, one can also calculate the geometry of the free surfaces through some uh, standard techniques and then impose the boundary condition, but these are really advanced things which I am not going to uh, talk about here. Now, so we, we know the framework based on which they, uh, the velocity field can be calculated. We have understood or we have at least appreciated you know uh, the extent of the, the, the extent of complexity that is involved in calculating those the equations that we generate are partial differential equations and we knowing the process we should be able to provide the boundary conditions. So, there should not be any ambiguity as far as the key mathematical framework uh, equations and boundary conditions are concerned in formulating fluid flow problem. Now, Coming to the issue of turbulence, I, I mentioned that using solving the Navier Stokes equation uh, um, you know, for turbulent flow is little bit difficult. Now, the point is that I mentioned uh, we want to, we cannot solve the equations that I, I wrote here x component, y component and z component uh, you know, by analytical means. We have to solve the equations uh, in uh, through numerical uh, technique, through a numerical technique. So, therefore, when you when you solve the equation through a numerical technique, we are obliged to use, you know, we, the, so the, suppose the reactor is there, I cannot have a continuous solution, but I have a discrete solution. I will select some points and then say that I wish to get the value of the dependent variable. The dependent variables in this case are the velocity components v x v i v x v y v z. So, I want to have the velocity in some discrete location. So, I have a differential equation or a set of differential equations. I convert them into a set of algebraic equations and how do I convert? I apply a numerical method. Okay? So, the essential purpose of the numerical method is to convert the differential equation into algebraic equation. Having obtained the algebraic equation okay, and these algebraic equations are derived for certain points. So, the continuous information of the differential equation is now lost when we discretize uh, you know the differential equation and derive uh, the algebraic equations. So, therefore, now I can have solution here, I can have solution here, I can have solution here, I can have solution here. So, there are, how do I know these points? These are the points that the person who is solving he desires. For example, I can say I need only 16 points on which the velocity distribution is needed. Someone else may say no, I do not want 16 points, I need 160 points. So, the person who is solving the equations, it is he who decides or 
you know, uh, the modeler or the, uh, the person who calculates, he decides that how many locations he is going to need the experiment, uh, uh, constitute, constitute uh, these uh, points. So, these points at which the solution is sought is termed as the nodal points or the grid points. Now, we must understand that if you, if, you, if you look at the structure here, so these are called the grid lines and the points are called the grid points. Now, in turbulent flows, for example, you have eddying motions and the size of the eddies, as you all know from your basic thermo, basic uh, transport phenomena can vary depending on where you are. You can have very small ed size eddies, when you have, we go towards the wall, you have big eddies in the bulk of the liquid. Now, if we want to resolve the motion within the small eddies, then obviously, these points need to be very close to each other. Okay? Now, if I have a motion here, you know, an eddying motion here and the control volume is this big, okay, I will not be able to see that whether there is a gradient of velocity here or not here, because you know, in this particular control volume, yeah, these nodes, it is, a, it is a very big control volume and it has a characteristic velocity. So, within this, so every nodal point here, to make it specifically, every nodal point is associated with a control volume and the value of the V x is assumed to be prevalent generally over the control volume, entire control volume. So, if the size of the eddy is smaller than the control volume size, in that case, the motion in the eddy cannot be resolved by the numerical grid itself. So, therefore, when the flow is turbulent, when the length scales are very, very small, we are obligated to use points which are not like this, but the points which may be extremely close to each other. Then only we can have tiny, tiny control volumes and these control volume size could be smaller than the size of the eddies and therefore, we should be able to resolve the turbulent motion accurately. If that happens, then what we are talking of a huge steel making reactor, 3 meter width, 3 meter depth. So, you are going to have, if the sizes of the eddies are of the order of microns or millimeters, you can imagine, you know, uh, that we can have millions of such nodal points. And at every point, I have to solve equations, which are non-linear, multidimensional and not such one equation. I have to solve 8 to 10 equations. So, we have to, we will take an enormously long computer time in order to get a meaningful solution, if we consider, construct a extremely fine numerical grid in order to solve the fluid flow equations numerically. So, therefore, this solution is basically termed as the direct numerical solution in turbulent flow literature. Okay. So, we will use Navier Stokes equation, but construct a very you know, closely spaced nodal points or grid points, where we seek the solution and then solve the Navier Stokes equation and obtain the details of the turbulent flow. Solve the equations in an unsteady mode, because turbulence is rarely steady, it is a you know, time dependent process. So, therefore, we will be constructing a very large number of nodal points and as a result of which as the number of nodal points are increasing, your computational task is also increasing. If I have, these are mean, there are so many unknowns to be known. In this case, there are, so for example, 4 into 3, 12 unknowns are to be obtained. In this case, maybe there may be 4000 unknowns, the way I have tried to draw the nodal points, there may be 4000 or 5000 nodal points within the domain itself. So, finer is the grid or closer are these points you will have to get more numbers and therefore, to get more numbers, you have to do, the computer has to do more amount of computational work. So, therefore, when you are talking of a practical size domain, we will see that well, the computational time may be going to one month, two months or three months. So, therefore, as of now with the largest computer, on a routine daily basis, we cannot carry out DNS for steel making processes. So, therefore, the equation, Navier Stokes equation directly cannot be as of now applied. In principle, theoretically there is no problem, but because we face this practical difficulty that because our computers do not have that large a power today, that we can obtain the direct numerical solution just like that in 5 minutes. No, it is not possible for such a big reactor. So, because of this constraint, we seek an alternative approach and that alternative approach is called, I am just going to introduce this name and not discuss, which is called the RANS, the Reynolds average Navier Stokes equation. So, some sort of averaging of the Navier Stokes equation is done and thereby the Runs equations are derived starting from the laminar flow equations 
or the exact equilibrium stress equation, we derive the Ranz equation and this Ranz equation then needs a turbulence model. So, Ranz equation plus turbulence model, then we can use such a sparse grid, there is no problem, okay, because we have averaged the behavior okay, and we have other various techniques also. For example, there is a technique called LES, large eddy simulation. Just for your information, I am giving you the name, but the point that I try to make is that the Navier-Stokes equation okay, with an extremely fine grid is still not a possibility for addressing all steel making problems. So, we try to look at an alternative way of predicting the flow in steel making reactor and most commonly used approach is the Reynolds average Navier Stokes plus a turbulence model. Okay. So, the moment you replace the Navier Stokes, exact Navier Stokes equation, now you have a, you have averaged it, you obtain the Reynolds uh, um, average Navier Stokes equation, but in that equation typically one sees that there is an unknown turbulent shear stress term. Say for example, these are the fluctuating velocity components and this is the time average of the product of the fluctuating velocity components. So, this sort of a term comes when we time average this equation and to, because this is now an unknown term. So, we have four equations, you remember, you have four equations, four unknowns, but when we have time averaged it, additional unknowns come into the picture and these additional unknowns are known as the turbulent shear stresses and to calculate these turbulent shear stresses, because four equations, five unknowns means we cannot solve them. We have to specify this turbulent shear stresses somehow and it is through the turbulence model that the turbulent shear stresses are prescribed. Okay? And we may have equations also directly written, conservation equation written for the turbulent shear stresses, but normally traditionally in steel making literature you will see that people have used turbulence model and that turbulence model basically is the platform for calculation of the turbulent shear stresses. So, Ranz equation and turbulence model equations are going to be used always as a Ranz plus turbulence. This becomes our, they have to be applied in conjunction. So, our as far as still as still making is concerned, if you want to calculate the flow of melt in still making reactors, in that case the fluid flow component okay, or the flow model or the theoretical framework for melt flow calculation will comprise of the Ranz equation and along with this we will require a turbulence model and the purpose of that turbulence model is to provide uh, estimation or you know provide information on the distribution of the turbulent shear stresses. So, I repeat again that we have originally four unknowns u x, u y, u v, u z and p and we have four equations, three conservation equation of motion and one continuity equation. So, problem is well defined, but when you time average it, we still have four unknowns, those four unknowns and on top of that we have additional unknowns which are turbulent shear stresses. So, unless these are prescribed, we cannot solve those four equations in a closed form and therefore, how do you calculate this? How do you know this? This comes from the turbulence model. It is sufficient for you to know up to this particular point itself. So, therefore, we can say that a flow model for a steel making reactor will comprise of the Reynolds, Reynolds average Navier Stokes equation plus the turbulence model. If you apply them in conjunction, you can obtain the time average velocity now, because this time averaging is because turbulent flow is what? The turbulent flow, for example, if you see a steady turbulent flow, a steady turbulent flow, for example, you can say that it goes random fluctuations are the characteristics of the turbulent flow okay, and this is a steady state. So, if you put a probe inside a turbulent flow, in that case you will see that there are random fluctuations with high frequency, which is a characteristic of turbulent flow. And then this can be averaged and this now represents what is known as the time average velocity. And when you solve the Ranz equation, you do not get the instantaneous velocity directly, you get an idea about the time average velocity and it is this time average velocity you use in your melting rate calculation, mass transport calculation, two fluid interaction calculation, drag force calculation and so on. One last one that I want to say that this term, the Reynolds stress term is 
be essentially formulated in terms of if you put a minus sign, then you can say the turbulence viscosity and the velocity gradient. So, we have uh, if this is uh, only in meaningful velocity gradient is this d v x over d y. And this is the now the time average velocity component. So, this is no more the unknown, this is as a part of this is there in the Ramsey equation. So, estimation of the shear stress, turbulent shear stress essentially boils down to the knowledge of the turbulence, what is known as the turbulence viscosity. And this turbulence viscosity basically is a fictitious quantity, do not confuse it with laminar viscosity. Dynamic viscosity or mu is a property of the fluid which depends on the state of the system. Pressure and temperature are constant, that means mu is constant. Mu t on the other hand is turbulence viscosity and that varies from one point to another point in the system, because it depends on. So, basically now going to the root of the problem, what does turbulence model do? The turbulence model actually provides us the distribution of mu t in the domain through an appropriate mathematical framework. So, we obtain mu t from the turbulence model, we substitute that mu t into the Ramsey equation, then the Ramsey equation boils down to four equations, four unknowns and we are in a position to solve and obtain meaningfully uh, the velocity field which are present in this field.